Okay, cool. <laughs> um, I'm here to produce a speaker. I'm here to introduce a speaker, Ian Romanek, and he's got a spe um, speech on reducing memory loss. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Ian Romanek. I work in the Open Source Technology Center at Intel. Uh, I lead the group that's working on the open source OpenGL driver for Intel graphics chips. Um, and I'm going to talk today about some work that I did around the middle, kind of into the last half of, of last year to reduce the memory usage of, the, of our GLSL uh, shading language compiler. So my slides are also already up. They're going to be available through the, through the conference eventually, but I figured I'd beat them to the, to the chase. Um, and the, the slides that are up there will also include, they're the slides and also the, the notes that I, that I made for myself on them. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about MESA project background, uh, the, problem that, the particular problem and set of problems that uh, we encountered, and then what was done to, to try to, to remedy the situation a bit. So MESA is the open source OpenGL driver stack. As a fairly large and important part of that, there's a hardware agnostic shading language compiler front end and, for lack of a better term, a middle end that includes a bunch of hardware independent optimizations and code transformations and a, and a bunch of other things like that, that that happen before you end up generating hardware instructions that actually run on the GPU. So word count dash L as of yesterday says that it's the, the hardware agnostic code is about 60,000 lines of C++ including comments and you know um, license headers and, and all that, that sort of, of filler bits. Part of this includes a, a TALIC clone uh, that we use for memory management. We call it RALIC. Uh, I believe that it was either Carl Wirth or Eric Anholt who talked about the compiler architecture and and in particular, the memory management system at LCA, I think in 2011, um, but I, I, I could be off on that. And so the, the important bit about this, I'm not going to go into the, the memory manager as a whole, is that most of our compiler stack uses Relic as sort of um, a mark and sweep garbage collector. So we have a lot of optimization passes and other kinds of code transformation passes that will create a new RALIC memory context, perform a bunch of operations on the, the IR tree, add some nodes, delete some nodes, move things around, do some stuff like this, and then makes a pass through all of the reachable nodes in the tree reparents them to the new context and then destroys the old context. So anything that's still attached to the old context sort of automatically gets freed. Um, this has a lot of advantages for us. It means that we don't have to worry about going through and deleting all of things in destructors and writing a whole bunch of code to sort of explicitly go through and make sure that we don't have any memory leaks. Everything just everything that's not reachable eventually gets destroyed. Uh, there's one little caveat to that that, that I'll I'll get to uh, a bit later. So we kind of developed this on the assumption modern computers are big and memory is cheap, so let's just you know develop code so that we can actually have a maintainable compiler and if we run into problems we'll worry about them later. Well, we ran into problems. So a lot of games have giant hulking piles of shaders. Uh, we've encountered a number of Unreal Engine 3 based games that have many tens of thousands of shaders. Um, we encountered a developer build of Dota 2 from Valve that on our compiler stack ate over four gigs of memory in the compiler at startup. So the, the Dota 2 developer build is kind of special because it tries to compile every shader and every variation of every shader um, at startup, even the variations that won't be used on your particular hardware platform. It just is, let's try to compile everything and make sure it all compiles so that developers will notice, oh, hey, there's one of the shaders that's broken that doesn't build. Let's fix that before it gets out into the wild. But, you know, it made the machine fall over. Oops. Um, there's also a lot of DX games that when you're running them, 
uh, in, a, in a virtual machine on a Linux host that's going to you know punch punch through and translate the the DX to OpenGL um, that exceeded the, the the sandbox capacity, which is depending on the the VM that you're using is either a gig or two gigs, and we were blowing way past that on on a bunch of you know modern large DX games. So we clearly had to do something about our memory usage um, because people running on other closed source drivers weren't encountering these problems with these with these applications. So I basically approached this like an optimization problem. So when you're optimizing an application for performance, you know it's it's a pretty well known path, right? You you go through and you collect some data figure out you know, where all the time is going in the case of an optimization problem, look for some big fish and or low-hanging fruit, fix problems, and then keep you know, lather, rinse, repeat until it's good enough, and then move on to the, to the next thing that you need to do, because you know, there's, there's always an infinity of infinities of, of work to do. Um, it ends up being a little bit different with memory usage, because it's not as familiar of a thing to try to try to tune for, right? I mean, if you're going to do performance work, there's huge piles of different tools that everyone knows about, sysprof, vtune, perf, you know, all of these different things that people know about since ever to, to try to, to diagnose and, and figure out where performance problems are. Um, but it's not, it doesn't seem as well trodden anymore for doing this with memory usage. So, I picked a couple of representative workloads. In this case, I used an API trace of a, a single frame of Dota 2 and used um, all the shaders that we know about in existence uh, in a, uh, a separate project called ShaderDB, which I'll talk about both of these a little bit more in a moment, um, and then collected a, a variety of kinds of data, collected data about reach the counts of reachable nodes in the IR, peak memory usage, and how our data structures are, are using memory. And I'll get to, to each of these in, in more detail uh, here shortly. So API trace is uh, a really, really useful uh, application for recording traces of OpenGL and I guess DirectX calls made by an application. So you can basically run your graphics application inside API trace. Every GL call that it does gets recorded and you get this sometimes really, really giant, and by really giant I mean several gigabytes dump of here's everything you did ever and then can trim that down to a, sm a small set of frames or a single frame and then can replay that back later. Um, almost always when we get a bug report in Mesa about any of the drivers, uh, you know, this frame is misrendered in this game, or you know, rough shadows don't show up, or whatever. The first thing we ask is, can you give us an API trace? Because that's way easier to to try to replay this this small thing than to try to get you know the game that we might have to go out and pay 50 bucks for. It's not so much of a problem for Intel because you know we can go out and buy that, but if it's you know someone working on you know, Nouveau or one of those drivers, um, they may, you know, some a hobbyist, they may not be able to just run out and buy every game so that they can reproduce a bug in it. And also, like all apps these days that have forced push updates on you, the bug that appears in version X of the game might magically not be reproducible in X plus one, but the problem still exists in the driver and we'd like to, we'd like to fix it. So the, the API trace you know, sort of gives us that, that reproducibility. Um, the other project that, that we used is, is ShaderDB. We, there's two uh, ShaderDB repos. There's a public repo and then there's also a private repo that, that we have. Um, between the two of them, it has, as far as we know, every shader we've ever seen in anything. So the public repo, we've imported all of the shaders from various open source projects and from a small number of closed source pro projects that have explicitly given us permission to, to be able to put their, their shaders in the repository. And then in our, our private repo is basically 
every shader from everything you can get for Linux on Steam. Um, so between the two of them, the last time I checked, um, which was before right around the X Developer Summit last year, so October-ish, there was on the order of 50,000 shaders uh, but between the two repositories. So it's a pretty good corpus of, of real world shaders. Okay, so to collect data from this, uh, one of the first things that I did is um, instrumented my code to um, go through, at, at, when an application has been run, gets to a point where all the shaders have been compiled and then in the driver just iterate through all the shaders and dump out information about every reachable node in all of the IR and collect, can collect up counts of here's all of the shader IR, you know, there's a million of IR variables, 50,000 IR assignments, et cetera, et cetera. And so we can kind of gauge where, you know, what types are are eating up all the all the memory and kind of uses that to um, direct the, the later optimization efforts. Uh, we make pretty heavy use of the visitor pattern. Adding support from it was really easy and took a really small of code. I think it was like to, to add all this this logging facility. And so it gave a pretty good idea of which IR nodes were most frequently used and, and represented, it, represented uh, the largest memory usage. But that information is good, but it doesn't really tell the whole story. Uh, and in some, some cases, it can somewhat fib to you. Uh, also needed to know what is the actual memory utilization of, of the application. And as in all things memory related, Valgrind for the win. Um, the, in particular, the massive tool uh, gives really good information about exactly how much memory is used at, at any point in time by, by the application. Um, there's two things about it that are kind of important for, for this case. Uh, one, you really want to collect data for both 32-bit and 64-bit if you're going to, you know, if you run in both environments. Um, in our case, most games that we care about are still 32-bit applications, so we need that data, but 60, collecting data for 64-bit is also a good sanity check, and each has different alignment rules and padding rules, and so a, something that you do that improves memory usage on 64-bit might not make any difference on 32-bit and, and vice versa. Um, the other thing that, that Massive was really good for is it gave before and after data for putting in commit messages to, to justify individual changes. Um, so I don't want to give a quick, a quick peek at what that looks like. So the, uh, where's my mouse there? So the, there's a, when you have a, a trace that you've corrected, collected from Massive, um, it generates an output file and the important bit is you get these detailed snapshots of the, the memory usage at any point in time. And for me, I cared about finding the peak memory usage. So now I can see, uh, of course. So right here, I can see that after 40 billion instructions had gone by, that I was using a total of 71 megabytes of heap. 66 of that, 66 megabyte, meg, bleh, 66 megabytes of that was useful, and another 5.1-ish megabytes were uh, padding and, and extra uh, junk used by the um, the allocation system. Let me get back to where I was. Um, so then, in addition, once I had found where the memory was going, uh, you know, which particular data structures were responsible for the most usage, could go through and try to uh, micro-optimize them, essentially. Uh, and uh, the PA hole uh, program was exceptionally useful for that. Uh, you can run that. Actually, I can go back out. I have that ready, too. So I can look at 
So one of my one of the data structures, and it will show exactly where there's um, bits of padding and unused unused areas of of data, so that you can see there's sort of wasted bits in your data structures and can try and rearrange things to to better utilize and and, and plug those holes. The one thing that you have to be aware of with this is um, sometimes it will lie to you a little bit when you're using C++ and it will, it will tell you things, um, for example, in a, in a drive class of, oh, you have this giant hole in it when really that giant hole is all the space utilized by the base class. So it's kind of fibbing, fibbing to you. Um, it wasn't entirely obvious at first and I wasted a couple hours like, why? <laughs> Why is the compiler doing something so terribly stupid and realized it was just the tool kind of lying to me? So there, there is a hole, but it's, it's a hole that's, that's full of useful stuff. Um, and again, this is another case where you need to collect data for 32-bit and 64-bit uh, because the padding rules are different. So this data structure would be tightly packed on 32-bit, but would have a hole on 64-bit. So one of the, f the first things that, that we came across was even with our mark and sweep, going through and uh, um, finding additional things that we could release earlier. So the, the, the biggest thing, um, OpenGL shading language has a bunch of built-in variables. So every single shader has access to a bunch of these, these built-in variables. Um, but most applications or most shaders will only use one or two of the built-ins and there'll be you know, four dozen extra variables that are, that are just sitting around um, unused. Previously, we weren't very um, aggressive about removing those because we kind of didn't care. Um, so I added a pass that would go through and delete these. And going by the count the nodes metric, this made, you know, tremendous improvements in our memory usage, but then when we went back and sanity checked those results using Valgrind, it said no change at all. So, you know, what the heck's going on there? Um, this is why you need two different kinds of, of metrics, right? To, to sort of double check each other. We found that all those symbols were, were still reachable through the symbol table, and that was actually the memory context that owned them. So even though we had removed sort of the, the declaration from the IR, the variable still existed. So we had this kind of pseudo leak. It wasn't really a leak because eventually the shader got destroyed, all that memory would go away, but in the interim, it, was, it should have been gone much, much sooner. Um, and this is you know, a problem that can occur with actual garbage collectors too, where you have these, these things that are reachable that shouldn't be reachable. Um, so then when we fixed that, by, by basically destroying the symbol table and then reconstructing it after all the optimizations. We, the, the results from Valgrind matched the results from uh, counting the actual nodes. Uh, a lot of the work was, like a lot of micro-optimization work, was just going through and repacking the structures and rearranging things, and it was really, really tedious death by a thousand cuts. I think there was about 40 patches of oh yeah, I swapped these two things, or I made this thing uh, an int 16t instead of an int, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that was, that was fairly boring, so I won't talk about that anymore. Uh, the, the one thing that I found that was kind of interesting um, is that there's a lot of data that you can make where you would typically want to allocate some memory for a thing, but you can maybe store it someplace else that isn't dynamically allocated. In the case of, of Relic, there's a lot of overhead by the memory allocator on every allocation because it has to track where that allocation is in the free list or in the free or allocated list, has to track who the parent context is, and a whole bunch of other things. And every memory allocator has some kind of bookkeeping overhead. So even if you allocate one byte, there's you know, the actual amount of memory used is considerably larger than that. So by taking some small things and not allocating them, you could get 
more memory savings than it seems like you should you should have gotten by just looking at you know the the sizes that you were passing to the allocator. But on the flip side, this means that you may have a you know sort of a, a time space trade off. You're going to save some allocation, but then you have to do some some additional work to to determine whether or not a thing has been dynamically allocated or not. Um, and this was one of the maybe a few cases where we were glad that we had used C++ because you can hide all of this in getter and setter functions. Um, because we were using Rallic, we didn't have to do anything clever in destructors, right? Because we didn't have to check in the destructor, oh, should I free this or not, depending on whether it was actually allocated. If it was allocated, it'll eventually go away because its context will eventually go away. Um, but we did have to be clever in clone methods to not allocate some, you know, allocate a copy of something that wasn't already that wasn't itself allocated. Um, so where can you store things if you're not always going to uh, dynamically allocate them? Well, one place that kind of made a few people cringe is you can store things in otherwise dead space. So if you have a class hierarchy like this where you have you know, some base class that's going to have some odd alignment at the end and then some derived class from that, you know, before that, that void star, there's going to be some space, right? Because it has to be padded out. And you can't normally get at that space. But you know it's there and you know how big it is. So you can pad it out in your base class and now you have some space. Now, on 64-bit, that's seven bytes of stuff there. And if you have a thing, you know, say in, in your base class, the thing that you're, if instead of being a void star, if that was a char star and you've got a lot of strings, seven bytes might be enough for most of your strings. So then in that derived class, you could point that, that, that uh, char star at storage and store your string there and not have the I think Rallic has 44 bytes of overhead for your short string. So we had um, a bit of healthy debate uh, about this in, the, in, the, in, a, in Mesa. Um, and I think the general consensus for how the rest of the compiler was architected was you. <laughs> um, so we didn't do, we didn't do this. Um, and partially because we came up with a different method that made this largely irrelevant. So what we went with is what, for lack of a better term, I'm going to call static flyweights um, for some really common data. For example, pretty much every C program you ever encounter has a variable named i, probably has one named j, uh, and if you've run out of ideas, it probably has foo and bar, and a bunch of other really common names. Well, GLSL is the same way. Um, you can look at all of the GLSL shaders ever, and there's a bunch of name strings that come up really, really, really frequently. So we could store all those strings as a static table in, in the, um, inside the driver itself, and when you encounter a variable that has one of those names, just point at that instead. Right? Don't allocate anything, just point at this, this static thing. Um, so the first step in doing that is figuring out, well, what names should you actually put in? And it would be great if you had some giant corpus of shaders that you could mine for these, oh yeah, we've got that. So again, I instrumented the driver so that at the end of compiling and, and linking a shader, it'll just run through it and dump out you know, print to standard error, var name, and then the name, and then just run it through a real simple pipeline, and now I've got a, a count of how many times each variable name occurs, um, and actually if you throw another uh, sort dash n on the end there, it comes out in order, and you can see, aha, here's the top 500 names that every shader uses. And it turns out that a bunch of the names are used thousands and thousands and thousands of times across um, across all the known shaders. So if we put those names in the static table, then we don't need to use the, the clever uh, dead space hack because most of the really commonly used names are short anyway. 
So this kind of gets into the territory of um, time-space trade-off in, in a little bit of a bad way. Because now you've got this table of, uh, I think I ended up with a thousand or so names that represented 90% of the names that were used more than once um, in, in, the, um, in all of ShaderDB. And you know, even doing an actual hash lookup on that for every single time you're going to create a variable has some cost. Right? And I didn't necessarily want to, to take that, that cost, um, which ends up kind of showing itself at the point of after you've done the hash calculation and then looking into the table and, and doing the, the stir comps. So what I settled on using, you, you pretty much can't get away from having the hash calculation. I settled on using a really clever data structure called a, a bloom filter. And this is basically the, the trivial reject. So a bloom filter works, you have a very large number of bits and you have some small number of hashes. So you take your data, you run each of your hashes on it, and that's going to give you some number. So now you have um, n numbers. And you look in your bit set, and if all n of those bits are set, and if you've, if you've properly tuned n and m, you have an extremely high probability that the data that, you're, that, you've, that you've hashed and that you're now looking up in the bit set is actually in your set that you care about. Um, so experimentally, there's, there's very formal methods for figuring out based on your hashes um, and your data set, how many bits you should use. Um, but I decided that kind of gave me a headache. I'm not very much of a, of a formal methods kind of a, kind of a guy. Uh, so I experimentally uh, did this using all of the, the names in ShaderDB uh, and settled on 8192 bits. So 1K byte for, for my bit set. I had one explicit hash and then a second implicit hash. Um, and running over ShaderDB out of about 6.7 million name lookups, there were 161,000 uh, names that were actually in the, the bit that were in the Bloom filter. And out of those, only 931 were not actually in the set. So it was much less than a 1% false positive rate, which seems pretty good. Um, and the hash, uh, the, hash val uh, the hash calculation was extremely trivial and you know, basically primed the data into the cache so that then you had to do a, a stir copy anyway to put it into the allocation. And so the, the time taken for doing the hash calculation just kind of disappeared in the noise anyway. Um, Um, so there's a couple of patches that are actually still out on the mailing list. These kind of got stuck behind the, the U patch. Um, so you can actually see the, the really, really simple implementation of the, the Bloom filter and of the, uh, the static lookup. Um, so the results out of, out of the whole thing, um, bef for both 32 and 64 bit on the, the Dota 2 trace, it started off with about 67 megabytes running on 32 bit and about 106 megabytes on 64 um, and after was 65 and 92. So on that, you know, running that trace, which included the textures, the vertex models and everything else involved in the trace, cut 13% of the whole thing by just reducing uh, the memory usage of the compiler. So it was a pretty, pretty significant. Um, it also made the, the debug build of Dota 2 that compiled all the shaders ever uh, actually runnable on a, I think we were able to run it reasonably on a two gig machine, whereas before it was falling over on a four gig machine. So that was, that was very nice. Um, we still have a bunch of problems on the, the virtualized systems, um, and we're, this is, so this is ongoing work. There's a bunch of other places where we can still uh, trim some, some memory usage, um, but 
these were the, the results that we had at, at that point. Um, one of the big areas where we have left is the one, one of our base classes of sort of the whole shebang is a linked list class. So everything can be in a linked list, even though most things will never actually be in a linked list. So we're sort of dragging our feet on doing the transition to not have everything be a linked list node, and we'll just box the things that, that actually need to be in a linked list. But it's, I don't know, it's really, really unpleasant <laughs> to have to go through and make all of, all of that change. So we're kind of, ooh, ooh, look, here's something way more interesting and, and more useful to work on. We'll, we'll, we'll go do that, and we'll do this other thing later, because yuck. Um, the other thing that, that came out of this that I found really useful is if you don't know about uh, git rebase-i-x, you should know about it because it is maybe the best thing about git rebase ever. So you can basically, in an interactive rebase, after each um, commit gets applied, you can have some command run that will do stuff. And depending on the output of that command, the rebase will either stop there or it will continue on. So the common and sort of intended usage is you're doing some giant rebase of you know your 150 patch series and you want to rebuild after each pass to make or after each patch to make sure you haven't broken the build. Um, what I used it for is after each of my patches I ran my API trace and with um, Valgrind, scraped the output, and this, this bit of text right here was able to collect the before and after results and generated a big file that was the short log message of the commit and then this data that it just scraped all of that and collected all that up in and, and doing the giant rebase while I was at lunch or something, and then came back and did another rebase and cut and pasted the, the before and after data actually into the commit messages. So that then in your commits, you have nice, here's the data to justify doing this particular change, which I think more projects should, should require people to, to put you know, before and after justification data in, in commit messages, because it really is exceptionally helpful when someone comes back two years later and looks at some crazy optimization and says, why did they do this? You, then you've got some, some actual concrete justification of it helped this app in this particular way and here's some data. Okay, so it looks like we'll probably actually be able to go off to lunch early. Uh, I don't think that will make anyone too terribly sad. Um, thank you for attending, and are there any questions? Um, when you started wait, the wait for the mic. Um, when you started uh, reducing the memory usage, did you notice any actual runtime you know, throughput improvements due to you know, better cache locality, those sorts of things? Um, you know, I didn't, but primarily because I wasn't, I wasn't measuring it, and certainly when I was running under Valgrind, the, the running the traces took forever because it adds you know, heaps and heaps of overhead. Um, I don't think that they're probably would have been a lot of improvement just because of the, the nature of the way that our, our compiler is structured where we have a lot of um, individual passes that just run over all of everything. So once you get to the next optimization pass, things that had gotten pulled into the cache early in the previous pass have been blown out of the cache already. So we haven't I wouldn't expect to see a lot of a lot of benefit for that on non-trivial applications. So when you did these optimizations for memory, did they have any effect on the CPU usage? Yeah, I mean that was what 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 he was uh uh, asking. Um, and other than a small amount of noise that was added in doing the, the hash lookups, um, I, I didn't notice anything. Um, but like I said, I wasn't, I wasn't really measuring for that. Um, and most of the, 
the methods that I was using to, to measure for changes, um, the, the instrumentation added enough overhead that, that the in instrumentation was, was all the time, right? I mean, running, as part of the reason why I used a very small trimmed trace of, of Dota 2 is even that um, on my you know, fairly recent laptop took about seven minutes to run just because Valgrind adds so much overhead. And that was also why, you know, automate collecting of your data so you just start the whole process running and, you know, go home and go to bed or something. <laughs> and when you come back, it's, it's surely done. All right, I think that's it. Um, thank you for speaking. As a show of our gratitude, we have a good... Thank you. <laughs>